Precious God, thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for reminding us that you are not done with us yet. And that, Lord, you have a plan and a purpose. And that as hard as we find it, that your will be done. Even when we don't understand. Even when we have no concept. Father, speak to us through your word this morning that we may hear you loudly and clearly. Let your message just ruminate in our hearts today, Lord God. Father God, for the very reason that when we leave this place this morning, we will know that we have had an encounter with the God Almighty. Amen. So this... This week I had a plan, (laughs) but God had another plan. (laughs) And halfway through, maybe even three quarters of the way through, I really felt like I needed to change um, what I was going to talk to you about. And I I was in the mind of, we're going on to prayer, because I'm pushing prayer, 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 because God is telling me foundation, the prayer is our foundation, we can't do that without it, but... Um, with what Sharon has been going through with um, Josh and this struggle with his blood and the exciting news there, um, I just felt God take me uh, to this place of, of the blood. <laughs> so, so when we look at um, this verse in Leviticus 7, verses uh, 26 and 27, Too many markers in my Bible today. And wherever you live, you must not eat the blood of any bird or animal. Anyone who eats blood must be cut off from their people. You know, the Bible is a book of blood, and it's a bloody book. There's blood mentioned from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is the only thing that gives life to our teaching and power to the word of God is that message of blood, which is the very life and the very power of the gospel. You see, the Bible is a living book. And the only book in the whole world, which we remember I said to you not so long ago, was the top seller in the whole world and over 10 million copies get sold. I think that was the number every year. It is, it, it, it is a book that imparts life to those who will believe with their hearts what it teaches. And I know there's so much going on now about what the Bible says and should we believe it and, and this isn't the word of God, it's the word of man. And, you know, but Hebrews 4 reminds us that the word of God is alive and it's active. And it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Right? His powerful word is sharp. It's as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, the message, the message Bible tells us. That his powerful word is as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. So, the word of God is very distinct from any other books for the very reason that this blood that circulates through, the, through every page and in every verse from generation, Genesis to Revelation, um, we just see a stream of blood that, that imparts this through this book. Like wherever you're going, the word of God is flowing through this. And so this, is, this book is the very life of God, the very life of God. And without the blood in this book, there will be no difference. It will, it will be no different to this this other book that I have that's giving me facts. It's not going to be any different to that if, if the message of the blood wasn't in here. So Leviticus 17.11 reminds us that for the life of a creature is in the blood and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. We need to remember that. You know when when we hear the story of creation and it talks about God breathed life into Adam, it wasn't breath into his lungs that he gave him. 
It was blood into his veins that he gave him. Because without blood, there's no life. There's absolutely no life, right? Um, although flesh has life blood, we are, we are talking today, we're going to talk about the human blood, and, and, and particularly that of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus not only has physically, but also an eternal life for us. So, you see, um, the, the human body, this is what I found so interesting, and, and it was as we were talking about what happened with Joshua, the human body is made up of different t- kinds of tissues. So we have muscles and nerves, and we have fat, and we have glands, and we have bones, and connective tissues, etc., etc. I'm not a medical doctor, so don't quote me on any of this stuff. So, All these things have one thing in common. They are fixed cells, right? They are fixed. But they are so microscopically small, and they have a limited function. Blood is fluid, and it's mobile. It goes throughout the whole body, touches all the shell, cells, tissues, all these things are, I mentioned before, right? So it's not limited to one part. It's free to move through the whole body. Your blood just flows right through your body, right? It supplies every single cell in our body with nourishment and carries off the waste products and the ashes of the cell activity, in, and that's called the cell metabol- met- metabolism, metabolism. You agree with me, nurse? There you go. Look at that. I did my homework this week. See, I can go become a nurse now. Maybe not. In the normal human body, there are about five quarts of blood. And this is the cool part. The blood pumped by the heart circulates through the system every 23 seconds. Takes 23 seconds for our blood to circulate our whole body. Like that. That's so cool. You want to tell me we're not fearfully and wonderfully made? Like, wow. Wow. No man can create that. I'm sorry. I don't care what anybody says, right? 23 seconds so that every cell in our body is constantly supplied and cleansed at the same time. It is in constant communication with every other cell in the body. That, to me, people, is wow. That's amazing, right? So once blood fails to reach a cell or the member of the body, they promptly die, Because no man ever dies until his blood stops circulating. There's life in our blood. But you see, this is what the cool part is. The blood of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is called his body. We are members one of another. And in his body, Jesus Christ is the head and all believers are members of the body, jointly and severally. The members are related by the blood of Christ. The life of each one depends on Jesus' blood. Our life depends on the blood of Jesus. We depend solely for life, nourishment, cleansing, and growth on the blood of the Lamb. We are not cleansed by any other blood other than the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not nourished by any other blood other than the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not able to live by any other blood other than the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we are all different shapes, different sizes, different colors, different temperaments, different personalities. We even live in different houses. How's that? We we structured look very different. So, um, but yet we are all united by one tissue because That blood that flows, think about your body, it flows everywhere, but it touches every tissue. The blood of Jesus Christ touches every person in the body. Amen. He doesn't exclude anybody. I just think that's so cool, right? That is so cool that it reaches every member and not just every member, but every member everywhere. It doesn't matter whether we're in Canada or Africa. From North to South Pole, East to West, it reaches all of us. It doesn't matter where we are. There's no denomination, no geographic area that separates us from the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care how many church denominations there are. I don't care how many affiliations there are. Jesus Christ does not make that distinction. He says we're all covered by the blood. If we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are covered by his blood. End of story. Amen. Right? So... God wants us to get unity in that body. He wants us to work together. And 
we are lost. doesn't matter who, which church we belong to if we don't believe in, in, in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not. So, like I said, when God, at the beginning of this book, breathes life into Adam, he gave him blood to flow through that, through his body to give him life, right? So, the fact is that sin is in our blood because of what Adam did. There's sin that flows through us. And to help us to understand the necessity of the virgin birth, the blood of Jesus Christ needed to be pure and sinless, not tainted in any way. So I thought it was pretty cool, and I found this medical reference here, because I always used to think, okay, so God put the virgin in, in, in the womb. You know, he, put, he made Mary. But I was, I was always under the impression that mothers and babies shared the same blood. And I just found out this week that they don't. Look at that, nurse. See? See? This comes from one of the nursing handbooks. It says, and, and also um, a book, a handbook of obstetrics. So look at that. I was studying. So normally there is no communication between the fetal blood and the maternal blood. When the circulation of the blood begins in the embryo, it remains separate and distinct from that of the mother. All food and waste material which are interchanged between the embryo and the mother must pass through the blood vessel walls from one circulation to the other. So the fetus, the fetus receives its nourishment and oxygen from the mother's blood in its, in it, into its own through the medium of the placenta. Right? So the fetal heart pumps blood through the arteries of the umbilical cord into the placental vessels, which looping in and out of the uterine tissue and laying in close contact with the uterine vessels permit a diffusion through their walls of waste products from child to mother and of nourishment and oxygen from mother to child. And as has been said, this interchange is affected by the process of osmosis, and there is no direct mingling of the two blood currents. In other words, no maternal blood actually flows to the fetus, nor is there any direct fetal blood flow to the mother. Pretty cool, eh? You think, wow, 139, Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Because I, I did often have that question. was like, really? Like, how do, how do we say Jesus was without sin? He was born from a woman. Right? Yes, he wasn't impregnated the way it happens normally, but was by divine, but that's so cool to know that that is why the blood of Jesus is so pure, why it is untainted, unlike ours, through the sin of Adam, right? So Hebrews 9 reminds us, the blood of Christ. When Christ came as high priest, the good thing that we are now... Sorry. But when Christ came as high priest, of the good things that we are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, it is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats or calves, but he entered the holy place, the one for all, by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption." The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. So how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? So Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is reminding us once again that Jesus the blood of Jesus is pure. It is what sanctifies us through and through, inside and out. Not just out where, when they did those, the calves, when they did the um, sacrifices, they would sprinkle the blood uh, on you and it would outwardly cleanse you. But the blood of Jesus Christ does both. It cleans us inside and out, right? So the blood is the only tissue that is, is, is circulating throughout the body and it circulates to every living cell, as I've already said. So it is the liquid tissue that can reach every single blood, so um, every single cell in our body, and therefore unites all the members with the head, each one. So like I said, there's five quarts of blood in our body, and blood nourishes, it cleanses, and it feeds every single cell in our body. So you know what the cool part about learning about this was? Like the blood goes through our veins, and it, it picks up the waste products. 
and it actually uh, disperses, discharges it through our kidneys and our skin and our bowels and our lungs. But at the same time, it's refilling and charging up. And it, it loads up with oxygen and it starts that circulation again. All this is happening in 23 seconds in our body. So it's getting rid of all the junk and picking up fresh oxygen and it's flowing through our body again. And it's, getting, it's going, you go to the kidneys, you go to the lungs, you go to the skin, you go to the whatever. How amazing. What an amazing communication system. Right? And cleansing. Like, how cool is that? So it, it does everything that it needs to do. So... There's no contamination in this process. It's picking up garbage and sending out good stuff and there's no contamination. How cool is that? I'm like, what? How do we... So, you know what? The, the one guy in the one book that I was reading, he was saying, imagine if the garbage truck pulled up outside your house and said, by the way, here's your week's supply of food. I'll pick up your garbage and I'll supply you with food from the same truck. No different. The health department would be horrified. They'd be horrified. They'd be like, What? That's going to be contaminated, right? But our blood does that all in when 23 seconds, right? Millions and millions of times. I should have calculated that. Math, math man. I calculate how many times during a day our blood goes through our veins. We'll ask you at the end of this, okay? Keep going. So Christ is our supply. And we are washed as white as snow by the blood of Christ. And I, and I often wondered, how can we say we are washed white by blood? Because if you wash something in blood, it's going to be red. It's not going to be, it's not going to be white, right? So how is it? So this is the cool part. I get so excited. I hope you guys get this. It's, there's more red blood cells than white blood cells. But if I prick my finger, then... There comes an infection there. My body automatically starts producing white blood cells. And the white blood cells rush to that place of infection. Right? Millions of them. And they are called soldiers. These little soldiers say, alert, 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 there's an infection in Charmaine's finger. And so they rush to my finger. And they multiply, multiply, and multiply so they could get there. And what they do is that infection, they trap it. And some of these soldiers die in the process. And they pick up whatever that infection is and the germs and they trap it. And so that's where we get pus. And so that's what the pus happens. And then when that pus is expelled out of our body, the white cells, guess what that little army does? It goes in and cleans up. It says, oh, okay, let's just go clean up. You know, when there's a mess on the floor, we go clean up. And then once it's all cleaned up and the fear of infection is gone, they go back to being the minimal cell again. They just do their own thing. And they are way, way, way less than the blood, red blood cells. How cool is that? So when we're talking about being washed white through the blood of Christ, when there's an infection in our life, the white blood cells multiply. Jesus' blood is white blood cells. He's the soldiers that come to our rescue. I think that is so amazing how our body can speak to the blood of Jesus Christ in such a way that it's like, wow. How can you tell me that this just happened with a bang? How can you tell me that? I don't agree. I don't care who you are or how many degrees you have. That's not possible. It's just not possible. You know, and all that's left is a little scar. Just a little scar from that infection. But you see, not only does that happen, at the same time, our body actually produces antibodies. Now, I didn't go into all the medical terms. I was like, yeah, no, this is just too much for my little brain. But your body actually creates antibodies. And it actually prevents you from further infection in that area again. But it's not saying you'll never get infected in that area again. It's just you've, you've, now, you've now been created. There's just been an immunity created. So there's a little bit of a resilience in that area. That's where Jesus comes in and gives us a little resilience, right? When, we, when, when he says, I've washed you in the blood. So I want us to have an understanding of what this analogy looks like. Is that when we um, have accepted Jesus Christ and we washed white in the blood, it doesn't mean we'll never fall again. It doesn't mean we'll never sin again. 
it means we do have a resilience in that area, but we have to continually wash in the blood. We have to continually be calling those white blood cells to protect us and get rid of that infection, whatever it may be, infection, temptation, areas of weakness. We constantly have to be calling them in and saying, come alert. We have to be covered in that blood all the time. And this is why it makes so much more sense to me when you say covered in the blood. Right? I knew it had a, a sense before, but it's become so much more to me than just that. It is so much deeper than just, you know, when we're saying, Lord, I don't want to fall in this area. Give me the strength. Bring those little white soldiers and help them to protect me. Help them to trap that ugliness and expel it out of my body. Right? I don't want it to be part of my DNA. I don't want it to be part of who I am or what I do. Am I going to fall? Yes. Is Jesus going to send more white cells? Absolutely. But you know what? There are conditions. We, we can't just expect that, right? 1 John 1, 7 to 9. I'm going to read verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. So if we think, oh, well, I'm, not a, I'm okay. I haven't sinned. I don't need to confess anything. We make God out to be a liar. So in order to keep pleading the blood, we need to keep confessing our sins to God whenever we go wrong. And I know sometimes that brings me back to that 13-year-old girl who gave her life to Jesus Christ and came back to the altar week after week after week because I thought I could never get, I'm just so bad, that each, each week I have to give my life back to Christ. You know, it is a daily and a weekly and a minute-by-minute minute process to keep our minds in Christ Jesus. That's where it says pray continually. Pray continually in your head, Lord, guide me, Lord, direct me, Lord, help me. That's what praying continually is for us. Pray continually for that blood to be covering us in every area of our lives. It's tough. It doesn't mean we won't have weak moments. It doesn't mean we won't fall. We will. We will struggle. Because, you know, of course, Revelation reminds us that Satan is the accuser, and it tells us that in Revelation 12, verse starting at 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now, they have, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down, and they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they did not live, love their lives so much as to shrink from death. In other words, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. The enemy is our accuser. He is the liar that says, you're not good enough. You're not okay. You shouldn't be. You're not whatever. You don't have what it takes. You whatever. He accuses us day and night. But when we plead the blood of Jesus over us, he has to shut up in Jesus' name. Right? He has no authority on your head, on your body, on your mind, on your, on your situation. He has to. He has to be still. He doesn't have a choice. Right? Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Then you are covered by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? You know, I thought about it. The blood bank, there's always a call for blood to be donated. And they will draw your blood out of you and they will put additives on it and they will store it away for when there's an accident. And when, when something happens, they call for it. But you, but you know what? We all got different blood types. So I can't get an AB blood if I'm an O positive or whatever, vice versa. I don't know all the different makes. Don't quote me on this. So, but we can't just go and get it. But they, they, they're always calling for blood for, from the blood banks, right, to, to have that. Because also, not only that, it has a shelf life. 
it can't just be kept forever. It will, they'll have to dispose of it every, I don't know how often they dispose of it, but anyway, they do, right? So, but the blood bank of Jesus Christ is applied through our, you apply for it through faith. You don't have to go to the hospital and get hurt, <laughs> right? We don't have to go to the hospital to get hurt. We could just talk to our neighbor. No, I didn't say that. We get hurt all the time in, in different ways, shapes, and forms, right? But the blood of Jesus Christ can heal all of our hurts. And we just apply for that blood transfusion through faith. Through our faith in Jesus Christ. We say, I believe. Give me some new blood. <laughs> right? I want this. I want this. your blood. Wash my blood white as snow. And so the other part is, his blood bank never runs out. And another part is, there's no preservatives in there. It's pure. It's pure, it's pure, it's pure. And there's enough for everybody. And there's no types. One size fits all. You don't have to worry that my blood type's not going to match Jesus's because it matches. He made sure of that. He made sure of it that our blood type matches. And you know, his blood is incorruptible. The blood of Jesus is incorruptible. So first Peter... One eighteen says, For you know that it is not, was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, for the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We don't get an inheritance from stuff that can perish. It's an imperishable, life-cleansing blood, life-changing so if we haven't received Jesus' blood, I think it's time we, we, we actually question ourselves. And we also question of, you know, it's, it may be that we've made, I mean, we've made our commitments, but if we worry that I'm not good enough or I have too many sins or um, this one can't be covered because there's no age. Because, you know, there's, there's always those preachers that are telling you about the, the sin that's unforgivable and... You, if you do this, you're not going to be forgiven. And if you do that, you're not going to be forgiven, right? First John, I read it earlier, he says, If we confess with our mouth, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And we are able to, to receive that clean blood in, in our body. Physical, emotional, mental, whatever you need, that blood can be cleansed through those little white soldiers that's coming to our rescue every 23 seconds. It is to this that we come to the cross today. So people, pray continually. Pray continually. I think, I, I don't know, sometimes I get really excited when I do my sermon prayer, but I'm like, is this going anywhere? But anyway, ruminate. Let it ruminate with you at about how fearfully and how wonderfully we are made and how cool it is that our blood, Jesus' blood, does so much for us. And when we remember this, when we come here and we think that that body that was broken for us and that blood that was given for us is so much more so much more than just a token it wasn't that he needed any glory he was saying I love you and I want you to be healed and I want you to be pure and I want you to be okay I care about you Right? 